Imagine yourself visiting a city park. What wildlife is present? Are there other park visitors? Chances are, you're imagining what you're likely to see. Human beings are particularly visual creatures. This is primarily how we experience life. And imagine paying attention, not to the landscape, but to the soundscape. Imagine closing your eyes and listening. What more can we learn by using another sense to understand our environment? You are likely to hear anthropophony, sounds with a human origin, like traffic, machinery, maybe distant music. You are likely to hear geophony, Natural sounds created by the environment, but not from a biological origin, like wind, the flow of water, ice cracking as the temperature drops. And finally, you'll hear biophony, sounds made by living organisms, bird calls, squirrels chattering. This is the focus of a relatively new field called soundscape ecology in which we study sound as an integral component to any ecosystem. For the most part, ecology has focused more so on the landscape, or the visual elements of an ecosystem, rather than the acoustic. After spending some time listening to the winter soundscape, I began to wonder, what might we learn if we were to listen to the underwater winter soundscape? Studying the acoustic components of other ecosystems has led us to a deeper understanding of species and environments but also how they can be affected by anthropophony. One study found that traffic noise and absence of an actual road was enough to reduce bird abundance by a quarter. They called this the phantom road effect, but there are other instances of anthropophony affecting wildlife. There's even evidence to suggest that some species can take advantage of anthropophony, using the noise to mask their activities and evading predation. This is known as the acoustic refuge hypothesis. I began to make frequent trips out to Wobbleman Lake, about an hour west of the city of Edmonton, along with my supervisor John Acorn, Jesse Acorn, an electrical engineer, and Dr. Richard Palmer, Professor Emeritus. Under a layer of ice a meter thick, the underwater environment of the lake was as foreign and mysterious as it gets. The under ice soundscape is fascinating. It's characterized by booms and cracks and creaks, sounds of the ice itself, expanding and contracting with changes in temperature. You can hear these sounds pick up on windier days. Anthropophony can travel extremely far underwater, especially lower frequencies. There are many times we heard footsteps or augering underwater even when we couldn't see anyone else out on the ice with us. As interesting as this all was to me, I couldn't help but wonder if I would hear any evidence of the life I knew was there somewhere. And it turns out I wasn't the only one. So, so I became interested in in the general question of whether there was any sort of animal sound under the ice. I mean, the, the soundscape is so interesting, but is any of it being made by animals? John's search for under ice biophony took him on multiple trips to multiple lakes to hear burbot, a fish known to make underwater sound. Despite going to Lac Saint Anne, a lake known for its burbot. With an expert fisherman, the burbot sounds remained elusive. There's also a kind of water bug called water boatmen or crixids that makes stridulation sounds underwater. They do this by rubbing their legs, which have a row of pegs, along their cheeks, using the air bubble surrounding their body as a resonating chamber. At one point, we were quite sure we were hearing these stridulations under the ice, but when John heard the sounds in an otherwise empty bucket of water, we realized that what we were hearing was actually an electronic artifact from our recording equipment. We never did end up hearing any burbot on any of our trips out, despite hearing that ice fishermen were catching plenty of them in Wabaman Lake. 
Between this and mistaking an electronic artifact for Crixid's stridulations, we could have been easily discouraged. But instead, we were more determined than ever to hear evidence of life under the ice. Uh, we're going to. This is actually a really cool story. Uh, we're going to be joined by Professor Richard Palmer, and and he's got a couple of uh, things that he's working on. But he will tell us a story about uh, uh, one one thing that he's working on about Alberta lakes. And there's this popping noise going on in Alberta lakes, and and what is behind the popping noise? Uh, well, you're going to have to stick around to find out. A colleague of mine, John Acorn, who's the, the better known as the nature nut and I are out putting hydrophones or underwater microphones under the ice because we hear some popping sounds in Alberta lakes. Mm. And we don't know what makes them. It could be an ice artifact or it could be some creature that we don't know yet that has this ability. So, and we need to amplify the sound a lot so they're not super loud okay. and we have to stand absolutely still because any movement creates sound. But if, you, if, if, if we don't have a distracting surface sounds, there's this very distinctive popping noise that only occurs in certain areas, for example, in Lake Wobbleman. In fact, we're probably going to head out there this weekend. So, yeah, it was 2012, not far from here at, at Whitewood Sands, and and we were hearing that um, that snappy poppy sound, and I I didn't know what it was. I you know it was it was a nice warm day like today, and so I just assumed it had something to do with the snow melting on top of the ice or something. You know I just made up some explanation that made sense to me at the time. It was eight years later. I was listening to recordings of the marine snapping shrimp online and I thought, well, wait a minute. That, that sounds a little bit like that recording from, from Wobbleman because I've never heard this sound in any other lake. And so I sent uh, the Wobbleman recording to Rich Palmer. I said, Rich, you know, is there any possible chance this is, this is cavitation? produced by some organism and, and that's when Rich became interested. So so yeah, it took a fair <laughs> a fair amount of time to clue into the fact that there was something worth studying here. In marine animals, uh, the most familiar ones and well known are snapping shrimp. Is they they jet water extremely fast with their claws, and those jets of water uh, move so fast that they create a vacuum behind them. That's called a cavitation bubble, and just the local the ambient water pressure causes the sides of that ambient that bubble to collapse. And when the sides come together, is when you get this incredibly loud snapping sound. Do we have any? non-marine animals that can do that like in in lake ecosystems or uh, this would be a first as to my knowledge the only animals that are, are known to make cavitation bubbles are in the sea is it an animal that lives on the bottom or is it an animal that lives in mid water are they more common close to shore or offshore and once you narrow down some of those things then you can start to focus your sampling to maybe try to collect them and figure out what they are whoa I, and there's a basket oh is there yeah oh oh great yeah. Oh, oh, it's a, a water boatman. A water boatman. That corrects it. Fantastic. With John's pop bottle trap and a glow stick lure, we were able to capture small crustaceans Diaptimus and Daphnia, and Crixids, or water boatmen. 11.31 and it's... Uh, 21. 21 and we'll get a depth once we pull it out here. Very sensitive to any noise from the feet on. This. Oh yeah, you can't you can't shuffle at all. Okay. Just as we'd hoped, the mysterious sound was still present. We began referring to the sound source as snapper poppers even though we still didn't know for sure if some creature was in fact the origin. Despite the frigid January temperatures, we were eager to return just to get to the bottom of it. We couldn't let ourselves get too excited just yet, though. It can be extremely difficult to relate an underwater sound to its source. We returned to Wabaman Lake the following week, but this time, we would record at three different beaches. First up was Moonlight Bay. 
The goal was to figure out whether the snapping popping could be heard at more than one location on the lake. We figured that if it was an ice artifact, we'd be able to hear it anywhere. Moonlight Bay's got a very narrow opening and it's connected to the, the main part of the lake. But because it's such a narrow opening to that lake, if we put the hydrophone down in, in Moonlight Bay and we didn't hear anything, um, that would suggest that um, it, wasn't, it wasn't being confounded by ice sounds coming from the whole lake. We were confused to find that Moonlight Bay was relatively quiet, aside from some background noise and a quiet, bubbling like sound. The Seba Beach recordings seemingly yielded the same results as the Moonlight Bay recordings. They were quiet, aside from some ice cracks and other obvious ice artifacts. But the reason why it's actually exciting to record here is that the other two places we've been today, Moonlight Bay and Seba Beach, we've heard nothing. And so this is the definitive test about whether the sounds that are being made are, well, it's not a definitive test, but it would be a very positive test uh, that the sounds are being made by some creature because there's something unusual about this spot. If we hear it, if we don't hear it, project over. An interesting thing is that the low frequencies, um, we hear those when the ice cracks in a, in a very noticeable way. Um, when we have a big ice crack, and then when we hear, you know, we look at the spectrogram and there's something in the low end. But the interesting mm -hmm. thing about the snap, snap and crackle pop sounds yeah. is that they don't have much below, say, one kilohertz, which maybe suggests that they're produced by something very small bodied. Right. Um, I don't know. Okay, well, moment of truth. <laughs> Snowmobiles, give me a break. <laughs> At our third and final location of the day, we finally did hear the snapping and popping we were hoping for. To hear it at only one of three locations, all visited on the same day, led us to believe that this really could be a creature, and not just an artifact of the ice. This trip, we returned to find the Wabaman Lake underwater soundscape noisier than ever. Whoa! <laughs> That's something else altogether. But there's still the background popping, absolutely. So we have crackle, crackle pop sounds, and we have all these little weak, 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 weak sounds that are kind of, they, they're just sort of bubble noises, I think. But I don't know where they're coming from, and I don't think we've heard them before. Well, that's exciting. But, but we, we, do, we do have, have the crackles, though. Yeah, we do. Oh, man. That's good news. That is, that's excellent news, because yesterday at Lake Isle was crackle-free. So, uh, what have we found so far? Um, a lot of bubbling near shore, which is totally different and could actually make it hard for us to extract data. But certainly at our mid-distance uh, site here, about 100 meters offshore, it's really quite amazing. I'm, I'm actually thrilled to hear as much crackling as we do. More and more this is sounding less like an ice artifact and more like some kind of creatures. Our far offshore one is going to be a fun one to check. If we're lucky and it's consistent with the last pattern, it should be quite a bit quieter offshore. And I think if we hear that, 
that really strengthens the idea that there's some creatures under the ice surface here. So, good start to the day. <laughs> we returned the next day to retrieve some traps and decided to have a listen as well. It's quiet. It's quiet, really. It's quiet today. Yeah, no, no crackle popping. A few of the um, bubbly ice cracks. It's quiet today. This place is so mystifying. You know, I, I think all of us vacillate. You know, one minute we're, we're pretty sure that this is a sound made by a living organism or lots of living organisms. And, and the next minute we're pretty sure that it's made by the ice and then we remember that not all lakes make this sound. In fact, this is the only lake we know that makes this sound. Maybe it has to do with springs or groundwater or plumbing or the railroad. And at the end of the day, I have no idea. And the, the thinking goes, anyhow, that we take a couple of gallons of hot water supplemented with boiling water here. And the theory is after we dump the hot water down, it'll be less dense than the surrounding very cold lake water. and It'll spread out right underneath the bottom of the ice and create, for a few minutes anyhow, a really abrupt thermal difference. If the sounds go up spectacularly five or ten fold, that strongly hints that it's something to do with tiny little cracking right at the air, the ice water interface. If there's no change at all, it leaves open the snapper popper creature hypothesis. was an increase in the, in the snapper popper sounds, then it, it wasn't dramatic. It uh, may be statistically useful, but uh, yeah, I didn't notice that much of a change with the, with the hot water. Once again, we left with more questions than we arrived with. We couldn't definitively interpret the results of our hot water experiment. In fact, soon, Rich would realize that we barely used enough hot water to fill the ice hole, and we'd need even more to be sure that it would spread under the surface of the ice. We decided to conduct one more hot water experiment, but this time with twice as much hot water. This is what we heard before pouring in the hot water. And after. It may not sound very dramatic, but Rich's analyses showed that adding the hot water had a dramatic effect on the snapper pops. They increased significantly after its addition and gradually decayed over time. The final hot water experiment had almost definitively refused the snapper popper creature hypothesis, but we returned for one last experiment anyway. We decided to test whether the vertical orientation of the hydrophone made any difference to what we were hearing. We also wanted to use two hydrophones to see if there were any small differences between the arrival times of the snaps. Oh, it's <laughs> almost as good as the hot water experiment. It's, it's really good. It's really good. It's it's a it's it's a concert down there Whoa. today. We should. Um, oh man, there's some loud ones. <laughs> it's, it's. What do you think? It's there's a lot going on. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like the Wabamum Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> We found that the snaps and pops were coming from a distance as opposed to coming from something small near the hydrophones.
We stood silently to listen one final time for the winter. It had become almost meditative, a weekend ritual to listen intently to the Andres soundscape. The hydrophone's orientation didn't seem to affect what we were hearing, but that was only half the reason for a return that Sunday. The other reason was because we simply enjoyed it. For me, the, the really exciting thing that happened this winter was to figure out that just under the ice, even in the middle of winter, even at very cold temperatures, there is an interesting little uh, assemblage of critters. There are crustaceans, planktonic crustaceans such as Daphnia and Diaptimus, and there are Corixid bugs, water boatmen, feeding on those crustaceans. Uh, the only one that we've been able to confirm is Ceno Corixid dacatensis, but there you go. Why does this lake have the snapper popper sound? That we don't know. We have some ideas. Maybe it's just something to do with the ice. Maybe it's, uh, you know, maybe it's not. But actually, the, the, the thing probably most interesting to me has been uh, getting some of these recordings of ice cracking noises that are really remarkable, especially some of the, well, I mean, the, the whole project has is, is taken us to more lakes than just Wobbman, and then especially at, uh, I think it was Lake Isle, we had some incredible cracks that uh, I might use for some semi-musical purpose or something, I don't know. But also it's, it's indicated just how much uh, the ice can function kind of like a reverberating plate. Mm. Um, you know, it almost makes me want to try doing something with ice as a source of reverberation. <laughs> well, so we're, we're just about two months into this project, having started at the end of January, and one might ask, was that two months worth it? Because we've made how many trips out over those two months? And, and as far as I'm concerned, it's been quite quite wonderful because the puzzle that got us interested at the beginning, um, it's maybe not completely solved now, but it was certainly a, a worthwhile puzzle to try to solve. The puzzle is that the really loud snapping, popping sounds that we hear that were in all their glory today seem to be unique or nearly unique to this lake. And that that's a tricky thing to explain over the two months of, of listening what are the kind of definitive answers we've come to and I guess there aren't any really definitive ones but certainly that the hot water experiment dumping that large volume of hot water and getting a sudden pulse in sounds very similar to the normal snapper popper sounds we get that's pretty close to definitive that the source is something to do with ice deformation and, and cracking. Do you, do you think there would be any value to try a hydrophone recording in the summer? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Um, and the trick is that you have to do that from a boat, unless you have extremely large sandals, which by my calculation in my animal structure and function course are about a kilometer in diameter. So water striders walk on the water surface, and humans could too, but they would need sandals that are about a kilometer in diameter. But sure, I would. I, would, I think that would be worthwhile doing, because that would, if you heard it in the summer, or when there's no ice, I'd be back. After spending the winter outside recording under the ice, there's a lot we've learned. We know that anthropophony can travel great distances underwater before reaching attenuation. We know that for some reason, Wabaman Lake has a curious snapping-popping component to its soundscape. Of course, we still have a lot of unanswered questions. What is the cause of the snapping-popping sounds if not a creature? If it is the ice making the sound, how does it happen? So now it's June and I'm back at Fallis and today it's going to be plus 30 instead of minus 30 like when we started out coming here. Um, so far this summer we haven't heard any of the snapper poppers but we are hearing crickets stridulating under the water and we think we might have some of our winter recordings with the same sound. So we're just working on finding out which species we might have heard over the winter, if any, 
And as for the snapper poppers, it's still a mystery. We think it's probably some artifact of the ice, but we're not really sure about that. So we'll probably be back out next winter to investigate it further. And I can't believe I'm saying this in Alberta, but I'm actually looking forward to it. <laughs>